Salam. This is Yahya Davidi speaking to you from Beit Ha'elit, near the biblical site of Bethlehem, where Bethlehem was, or probably was close to it in the biblical times. But uh, Beit Ha'elit is also close to the city, Asian city of Beit Ha, which in Roman times was a center of resistance to Roman rule. And uh, even now, Beit Ha'elit is uh, important in, um, in many ways. It is a religious city, uh, a city of the ultra-Orthodox, and it is also a major city on the so-called West Bank, the area of Judah, which is uh, a semi-autonomous region, a region that uh, supports itself, and uh, it is quite important. At all events, this is where we are speaking from, and today we are about to speak about King David, and Bathsheba. We all know the story of King David and Bathsheba. We know how how a superficial reading of the Bible, in English translation, gives us the uh, scenario of uh, the depicts David as having done something which was reprehensible. Morally, uh, to, morally disagreeable to our sensibilities. Very bad. David is depicted as having strolled around the roof of his house after he was king, saw a woman washing herself, did, did, uh, clarified uh, who the woman was, had her brought to him, lay with her, got her pregnant, and then her husband who was away fighting at the front against enemies of Israel, had him sent back, brought him into the palace, tried to get him to go home, and uh, one uh, one night, and uh, when he wouldn't do that, the next night he tried to get him drunk and uh, give him a surfeit of food and drink, and then send him home. And on both occasions, he did not succeed. And the impression is that he wants to send him home in order that he should lie with his wife and then think that the baby is his. And when he doesn't do this, he sends a message to Joab, Joab, in, in spoken Hebrew, Joab or Joab, the head of the army, and tells him that this person, Uriah the Hittite, should be put in, in the front with other soldiers and where, where they know they, are, they have dangerous opponents, where, where they know the fighting is fierce and the opponents are especially formidable to get put at the, uh, Uriah in that, in that location. And when they start fighting, to have his fellow soldiers pulled back, leave Uriah in the lurch to be overwhelmed and killed. And something like that seems to have happened because Uriah is killed in the fighting. And then the prophet Nathan comes to David and in the meantime manages to marry uh, Bath, uh, Bathsheba, the lady. And they have a, their child is born to them. So Nathan the prophet comes to them and he rebukes David very severely, curses him. And uh, a severe punishment is imposed upon him whose effects are liable to last until the end of time, because for henceforth, even though the descendants of David will always be the rightful kings of Israel, they will always be susceptible, liable to be visited by the sword. There will always be problems that are liable to come upon them if they do not go on the right track, more than would otherwise have been the case. And this is all because of the, of the story of Uria. And David is uh, repents. When he dies, he was, it says that his heart was found to be whole with God, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Uh, so that's the way uh, we understand the story, and it's not exactly incorrect. Something like that did happen, but not exactly. There were extenuating circumstances, in some details are very extenuating, so that it comes out that even though David is was guilty of something. He was punished after all. God himself, through the prophet Nathan, did condemn him. It wasn't as bad as we would think. The were the situation is not as we would think it might be by a superficial reading, because uh, other verses which clarify and explain, and uh, other inf additional information which puts the whole picture in another framework, in a different frame of reference, and it is worth our while to understand this, to know it, and in doing so we also gain a, 
a, a deeper appreciation of the Bible, a greater comprehension of the biblical text, an insight into the lives of David and his entourage and the people around him in the society at that time, and also an insight into the great commentators on the Bible and how they thought and what they thought of the situation, how they explained it. And it just it widens our, our, our ability to appreciate this, these passages of Scripture and Scripture in general. So that is what we have done. We have written a book on this subject called David and Bathsheba. And now we are going to give an overview of what the book says and, over, and uh, of the case in general. This is worth, uh, worth listening to. And uh, I hope you will appreciate uh, what we are about to say. We're a bit longer than usual, but we won't. We will try not to bore you. We'll try not to to uh, draw things out because the subject is of interest and the subject is important. So this is how we have it. We also we are basing ourselves on on the Hebrew text on the text of the Hebrew Bible, with all the traditions in the Bible, Talmud, and so on. Commentators, archaeology, historical references present-day sociological references, uh, bio biology, a lot of sources you'll see for yourself, we'll, we'll get through it, and it's be worth, worth uh, listening to, worth, worth uh, learning from, the good willing. Anyway, we're told that David, he went to sleep, he went to sleep, and he woke up in the evening, see, see to Samuel 11, 2, and he, he went for a walk around his roof, then the uh, rooftops were flat, in the Middle East they still are on the various, the rooftops were flat, they had a wall around them, and in effect, this rooftop was actually, the, it says the roof of his house is actually a palace. He was the king of the time. The roof of the palace was quite large, and, uh, and uh, the, it was in, in compass, there was a wall around it, which was the law. It had every, the rooftops had to have a wall around them because that was where people lived. They, cult, uh, they dried flax out to make clothes, uh, to make linen. Where they dried flax on the roofs. They cured feud stuff on the roofs. They ate there. They, they slept there sometimes. A uh, person would go to the rooftop to get away from a nagging wife. It was a place of where a person could have a little, little bit of privacy. And they was being the king, being always surrounded by people, and not being able to go outside possibly because of poor security re reasons, having to be careful. But he could always go up on the roof. No one was going to worry him there, and he could be alone and think and contemplate and see what was going on. We also find that Nebuchadnezzar, as we find in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar also used to walk around his roof and, just, and, uh, and contemplate the things of his kingdom. Let's see uh, Daniel 4, verse 29. And so uh, this is what David was up there, and also you should know that on the rooftop there was a mikvot. A mikvot is a pool, a ritual pool of water. And this water has to be... Uh, 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 drawn together in a special, in a certain way. You can't just uh, make a bathtub and then go, or a swimming pool and then bring water up in buckets and pour it in because that makes the, the water ritually un, un, uh, impure, ritually not kosher. It has to be a collection of rainwater or water from a spring and has to be enter the pool in a specific, specific way through uh, prepared channels or directly from the, from the heavens through the rain and uh, in those days in Mikvot these pools of water were quite common even now you can go to uh, Susia for instance Susia was a place where I used to live in the southern uh, Hebron mountains uh, south of Jerusalem and there they have an old Jewish settlement dating back to 300 CE and later where the Jews lived and uh, you can still see the Jewish buildings where they used to live in the caves, which the subterranean dwellings as well that they used to dwell in or use for storehouses, storehouses, storage places. And besides, every nearly every single dwelling you find a mikvah. A mikvah, right, but part of the general household, and people used to immerse themselves in a mikvah and to ritually purify themselves. Religious Jews still use mikvah, right, but they use them a little bit less than than uh, they used to in the olden times. They still use them, and they have to be used. Certain For certain uh, things, they have to be used. The law requires the mikvah to be used in order to purify oneself. Uh, but there are levels of purity. Uh, people who worked in the temple, the priests and the Levites who worked in the temple, had to maintain a higher standard of purity than the average person. 
יש מוזרמו, היא כמו כאילו בבוק הבלוויניקוס. And you can see that there were quite much more stricter, there was much more stricter laws applied to the Cohens, to the priests, and the Levites, than to ordinary people. But we find that not only priests and Levites, we also find in the Second Temple times the so-called Pharisees, or group, not all the Pharisees, but a part of them, also maintained strict laws of purity similar to those of the Cohens and the Levites. And we find hints of this that in the time of, of King Saul and King David, the royal household, also did that, and also David himself and his men, even while they were on the run, they also maintained a level of ritual purity. This was a, a characteristic of the royalty of the royal households of Saul and of David, and one could say even especially of David, so David maintained a, a regime of ritual purity. And on his rooftop he had migvaot, ritual bathway, bath, baths, one could say pools of water, which were, had a, like a screening around them, for modesty, uh, reasons of modesty, and that was where people went, or David went, or whoever needed it would go and purify themselves. And they did, and some people would do it even when they, even when they were not impure, just to a, a higher level of sanctity, one could say, by, uh, by frequently uh, uh, immersing themselves in, the, in these pools, and that was what they were for. And we also find hints of that David at that, at that, that, that very moment was overcome with certain drives, and he um, he understood that he was liable to uh, to fall down, to in, to come into temptation in sexual matters. He already had six women of his own, so he called, so he had sex with them, on, on, and then he went to sleep. And after having sex, in order to be rich or pure, according to these these regulations, one had to go to the mikvah. So apparently, David may have intended to go to the mikvah. When he went to the mikvah, he found a woman already there already immersing herself. And this woman was, about, was uh, called Bathsheba, actually a young girl, a very young girl, and he inquired after her and, she was, and he was told who she was. So he, he uh, had her sent to him and he had sex with her and she became pregnant. And we find that this girl was actually uh, seven, only, possibly only seven years old. And that's even hinted at her, in her name, Bathsheba. But wasn't that simple, wasn't it simple, don't jump, don't, don't react, I know how you're going to react, but uh, hear me out, because this has something to it, it has something to it, uh, according to the Talmud, the, um, in those in the time of David, girls, actually they based themselves on the Bible, and girls in the time of David, girls reached uh, puberty earlier, and they bore children much earlier, at seven or eight, it was common to do that, and even now, in our time, we have cases of this. There's a case in Peru, a girl of uh, five giving birth. Also cases in Ukraine, cases in South America, and uh, and for, for for very young girls and uh, girls of a little older, eight, nine, and so on. It's quite common. And uh, in the past, in the past, the age of puberty and, and the recent past, like 100 years ago, 150 years ago. The, the age of puberty was uh, later than it is now. The, it is coming down. Is uh, coming down. It's even getting to about ten. Ten years old is the average age of purity in the USA, according to the latest figures. A few, uh, few decades ago, it was uh, twelve or something. And then even before then, it was uh, higher. But it apparently goes up and down. All kinds of reasons for it. The Talmud says that uh, under ideal situations, uh, the age of pu uh, puberty is about 12 and a half. A girl is a uh, bar mitz bat mitzvah. She becomes responsible for herself at the age of 12, a boy at 13, and that is a normal time when they reach puberty. It is about the same, but, they, but, they, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily the, the, the ages are about the same, but they don't have to be exactly the same. In some cases, it might be beforehand, in some cases, it might be afterwards. They even say that it is dangerous for a girl to give birth at 12 and a half year, before 12 and a half years old. But they also say that in the time of David the situation was different. And we find, so we find that, that these differences occurred. And not only do we find that these differences occurred, and that it was different in the time of David, but we find then that, uh, that since uh, when uh, young girls who give, um, very young girls who give birth, they often stop growing as if the brain 
sends a message to the body that there's no more, no further need to grow. So they're smaller, much smaller in body size than others. It's a tendency. It's not a, not a, a iron class rule. It's a tendency that exists. And when, but when it, it becomes a general social phenomenon, then it could become a general rule. It could become the rule of the generality, which imposes itself upon the whole uh, biological body. Uh, we could say it's a parallel to something parallel. We could uh, quote the case of the red deer. The red deer is found in England and Scotland. The red deer were taken from England and Scotland to New Zealand. And now in New Zealand they grow to twice the size of those in the British Isles. Twice the size. And they automatically grow to that size because apparently the ecological niche that they, niche, uh, that they fit into in New Zealand requires them or is suited for them to grow to that that, that great size. Whereas in Britain, it's, they, the smaller they are, the more chance they have of survival. It's better off for them. So it's if they have a switch which is switched on or off according to the needs of the surroundings. This is not evolution, this inbuilt adaptation which exists in species, especially in, in species in their gen generality, and human beings are the same. We have uh, the, the, uh, the, a, few, uh, a couple of, we have sources that a few hundred years ago in uh, parts of the Middle East and Asia, parts of Asia, even then there were girls, it was common, it was accepted for girls of eight, around eight years old, to uh, already have uh, given birth to children. So it does happen, it could happen, and apparently it did happen, and according to tradition this was uh, the uh, situation in the time of David. And, uh, ah, so, what is the point of what we've been saying? The point of what we've been saying is not only were there was, um, were the, the, the girls of about seven or eight, they looked like our precocious, well-developed 13-year-olds, but so did all the women. All the women, whether they're 20, 30, 40, 60, they all looked the same. They all had the same body built, and they all looked like our 13-year-olds. And what is the point of this? Because now a normal man, a normal male, is not interested in little girls. Why is he not interested in little girls? Uh, first of all, because the little girls are immature. They cannot, uh, they're not built for, uh, for, to uh, relate to him as he needs to be related to. The society and the legal system are against him having any interest in that direction. And he has been conditioned not to think in that way. And not only that, but he can make comparisons. Have little girls and have grown-up women. There's a big difference between them. And he knows which is better, which is a natural, uh, natural pull towards that, which is um, more mature for him, more like himself. But if these conditions did not apply, as they apparently did not apply in the time of David, then he might react differently. And David also reacted differently. So he saw this woman, this girl, and he, uh, he, uh, had, uh, he did what, uh, what, he did, what he did. We should also be aware of judging everything in, that happened in the biblical times according to our own standards. Things were different then, the situation were different, people were different. People adapted themselves according to the prevailing situation, as we would do if we were in their place. So we have to be careful of applying our own standards to what happened then, even though to some degree we have to do so because uh, this is what the Bible requires of us. It requires of us to understand what went on and to to deal with it in order to understand what God Almighty wants from us because He speaks to us through the Bible. And this is His book and He's speaking to us through it. And uh, so uh, an another point another point concerning the young age of uh, of Bathsheba was that even though her father, her father was actually one of the thirty, her father of Bathsheba was Eliam, he was one of the thirty major warriors of the kingdom, so was Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba. Uriah the Hittite may not have been an Israeli, an Israeli. He may have had a half, halfway status of his own choice, not to be a fully fledged Israelite, or he may have been a, a Gentile altogether. That is another possibility, another option, which in our work, in this work uh, of concerning David and Bathsheba, we consider, we consider different options, 
but at present in this overview we're just taking it as for granted that he was an Israelite because it doesn't really matter the end the end uh, conclusion whatever pathway we take is that Uriah and Bathsheba were not really married in the full in, in the legal sense even though in the eyes of the public they were so this is also worth taking into consideration because David was over overwhelmed with his with the situation and a uh, person in that when, when he placed in such in, in, in such uh, in such a position often looks for reasons to justify his actions and there were legal justifications for him acting the way he had also even though the father and the grandfather who was Ahitophel of uh, Bathsheba, Ahitophel was a senior counsellor to King David, um, even though they were still alive, technically uh, Bathsheba was an orphan, she was a legal orphan, why was she a legal orphan? Because her father had given birth to her when he himself was under age. So that, according to the biblical law, or the rabbinical understanding of biblical law, would uh, make her a legal orphan. The legal orphan cannot be married. Uh, according to the Bible, a father can marry his girl, his, his daughter, from birth to whoever he wants, and the, the marriage is binding. That's uh, the biblical law. For, uh, for a legal orphan, or for an orphan, he cannot do it. But the sages instituted a special type of marriage for girls in, that, in such a situation, in order that they should not uh, be uh, seduced or go uh, or be taken along the wrong pathways as uh, could happen and even day even today it does happen so in order to prevent that they allowed them to be married at a young age but they had us uh, it was a marriage on condition a marriage on condition that the girl uh, upon reaching puberty had the choice of rejecting her husband altogether. She could say, I don't want him. Uh, I correct myself, she could, uh, any time she wanted to, she could reject her husband. And the, upon reaching puberty, she had the last chance to do so. If after reaching puberty, she had relations with her husband, then the marriage was binding from the point of view, fully binding from the point of view of biblical law. If at that time she says she refused him before witnesses and the marriage was annulled retroactively, as if it had never existed. And Bathsheba, when David met her on the roof, how did he meet her on the roof? Why did he meet her on the roof? Evidently, she had a re just had her first menstrual puri period, and as the Bible tells us, and a few verses later, that she had just finished her men menstrual puri period. She was purifying herself because she too was attached to the household of King David, as were, was, her, was her husband and her father. They didn't live in the courtyard, but they lived close by. She, they were attached to the household, and that was why she could get into the house go up on the roof, and she went up on the roof because she wanted to purify herself after just reached the reached her physical uh, fruition, as if to say, as if as if to become a woman in the biological sense. And she wanted to purify herself, but she did not want to uh, change situation to be known, to become public. Her husband was away in the field. It was, she was a young girl. She had her own considerations. She wanted this to be done in privacy. She knew there were mikvah art on the roof. She wanted to use them because they were seldom used. And it just happened at that time that David also felt a need to purify himself. So he met her. He, they bumped into each other, as if to say. And David, uh, and, and, so what happened after that? David uh, sent and had her brought to him. And uh, she became pregnant from this. So this is what happened. And this is why after that he uh, sent and asked for Uriah to come, that Uriah should come back from the field, he sent a job, and he asked Uriah to give him a description of the, what is going on, of the, of the, of the, 
of the of the uh, line up the arraignment of the soldiers and how they're besieging the city and he asked him all different questions as if that was the purpose of him having him called back and then he tried to get him to go to to his house and he ordered him actually ordered him to go to his house and he and it says and then he sent after him uh, a group of men burying um, what's called a mustate, which apparently is a gift from the king. A gift from the king could mean uh, food, uh, special foods, wine, I don't know, something from the king to, to accompany this senior military co uh, commander was going to his house. And th these men would have served as witnesses. The, the, the problem was he wanted Batsheva to publicly refuse admission or refuse coupling or refuse to be any longer with Uriah, and that would have retroactively annulled the marriage, and then it would therefore transpire that David technically had not done anything wrong by being with this girl and having gotten her pregnant, and he would have made uh, something uh, the best of a bad situation. But uh, the problem was that Uriah refused to go home. And not only did he refuse to go home, he also spoke disrespectively with uh, uh, verging on contempt to David. And he made, the, he spoke of uh, Joab, Joab the commander, as if Joab was, uh, had more prestige than David. So this is what we find. So the plot thickens as if to say, and not only that, we... We also find that other considerations played a part in what was about to event. There were other considerations that had happened beforehand. We find that Uriah the Hittite was also known as Ahimelech the Hittite. Apparently Uriah the Hittite was the same person as Ahimelech the Hittite. Ahimelech the Hittite in 1, the book of Samuel, the first book of Samuel, 26, verse 6. He was a companion of Abishai. Abishai was the brother of Joab. Joab, Joab, and Abishai, Abishai, uh, the different ways of pronouncing it. Um, there were two brothers. They were the brothers, the sons of Zuria. Zuria was the sister of David. In effect, they were, through his sister, his nephews. And they were foremost military commanders of the forces of David. But they were there was some degree of antipathy between between David and the sons of Zuria, as we find frequently throughout the whole story of David. Ahimele the Hittite, Ahimele the Hittite had accompanied Abishai. Abishai went down to David to the camp of Saul. At that time, Saul was the king of Israel. At the very beginning, and when we hear about David, Saul was the king of Israel. Saul wanted to kill David because he was jealous of him, and he pursued after David. And David had a following, a group of men and uh, women and children also uh, come uh, alongside them. And they were all in danger of being killed by Saul. And he had uh, shown his violence and his, uh, his, his ability to carry out the most dastardly deeds. So they went down to the camp and they found the camp sleeping. There was some type of miracle that had taken place. All the, all the men of Saul had fallen asleep. He too had fallen asleep. They came right up to the, to, to Saul. Abishai exhorted David to kill Saul. Get rid of him. Get rid of the enemy. God has delivered in him into your hand. He's a danger to us. And David refused because Saul was consecrated. The Mashiach Hashem he was a consecrated anointed and that he was holy. And so he refused to do so. But we can understand the point of view of Abishai because they were in danger and their families were in danger and he need, Saul had been placed in their hands and they could kill him. And But they didn't. And uh, David proved to Saul that he could have killed him and he did not. Saul relented and they, it was a temporary reconciliation. But uh, straight, uh, shortly after that, Saul renewed his attempts to catch David and his men and kill them. David had to flee, and so did his men with him. So we can understand there was a certain uh, resentment against David, a certain degree of recrimination against him. He was if to say too soft, too liberal, too noble for his own good. 
and he did not act with a sense of reality that was necessary to rule. And the other incidents that we find Abishai and uh, Joab taking this uh, this uh, this dance, and apparently Uriah shared it, as we can tell by, or we may infer by this way he spoke to David with the contempt, as if to say, and the uh, elevating Joab above. David, uh, so we see this uh, fiction between them, and uh, Abishai and Joab were the uh, nephews of David, they were the sons of his sister Zoria, and they needed each other, they did not want to get rid of David, they wanted uh, to control him perhaps, or to change his behaviour, force him to change his behaviour, so too David did not know how to manage without them, he needed them, he could not get rid of them, so there was a balance of forces, but uh, perhaps David wanted uh, to weaken them, and that is why he decided to get rid of Aurea, because Aurea, the Hittite, was, uh, was the chief of, of the 30 major warriors in Israel, the chief of the four, of 30, according to one source. The very least, he was a member of the 30. He was a foremost warrior, and, he, and by getting rid of him, as if to say, the, the, um, uh, the camp of uh, Job and Mabishai would be weakened. They would apparently agree to that. It was a compromise between them, and the alternative was to uh, to open a patrol to formally charge Aurea with treason or with whatever he had done, bring him before a court, and and, and uh, bring everything out into the open. And this may have forced Abishai and Job to take sides and even to come out against David, and who knows how things would have ended. So they decided or David decided to uh, get rid of Uria through having him killed in combat, as if to say this was also more honourable, or he was a hero, he was a great military warrior. So that to see him killed in combat was much a better death than having him publicly put to death as a common criminal for for whatever for responsibility for for, uh, for whatever he had done, and also for talking in a treasonous manner. But uh, the the, uh, the sages understand the Bible as saying that Nathan says that, that David was condemned for having killed Uria by the seed of Bnei Ammon. By having the Ammonites kill Uria, as if he gave and given glory to the God of the Ammonites. And this was the offense of David. So that is uh, so we uh, that is one point. Another point is that Uriah was not killed exactly as David commanded. David was not so guilty of the death of Uriah in the strict sense of the word. And we see this. We see this from biblical verses. The biblical verses tell us what happened, or we may uh, infer. We may deduce what happened from the biblical verses, and we find that that uh, we find that Joab brought Aurea to the front and he had, the front was prepared to, and he was intending to carry out the full plan according to the instructions of David but before he had a chance to do so the Ammonites attacked attacked them apparently sooner than they were expected to do so the Israelites drove the Ammonites back, got to the gate. It seems they, once they got to the gate, they, the gate was still open, they had a chance to take the whole city and possibly end the war. So they went in, or they fought there, and they were shot at by the Ammonite archers from the wall. And a great many of them were killed, including Uria. So Uria, as if to say, was one of the casualties of this general fray, and no special treatment had been done to get to cause his death. He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, together with a whole lot of other soldiers who had carried out a, 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 an attack in a way that was not advisable to do for, from a military point of view. And we learn this from, the, from what David says later and from what the messengers who relate what happened to David also tell him. So say, look up and look at the verses, is what it especially says, as we have explained it. Nevertheless, David is condemned for bringing about the death of Uria, and who knows, and also for bringing about the death of other numerous others. It seems we may deduce that from uh, different 
uh, verses and so on and sources that uh, what David had told Job to do became general knowledge. Become general knowledge. There was a certain degree of demoralization in the forces facing the Ammonites. The Ammonites, Ammonites, census. There were soldiers who were fighting for their lives in a desperate situation, and so they have a, an animal instincts when they sense weakness in their opponent. They sense a demoralization of weakness in the Israelites, so they attacked at once. This, this attack apparently took the Israelites by surprise, and the Israelites reacted, drove the Ammonites back, and got up to the gate. And apparently kept going, hoping to go all the way through. And then they were shot at and killed. And Uri was killed along with him. And uh, David may be blamed for giving the instructions that had caused the demoralization, that had caused a chain of events that resulted in so many people being killed, including Uriah. But, so David may be, have been responsible to this, even though which perhaps Job should have, uh, was also responsible. He should have taken a firmer hand. Uh, he should have uh, took steps that such an event should not have happened. But it did happen. And David was blamed for it by... God Almighty, according to the word of Nathan, a prophet, because uh, straight after that David took, publicly took Bathsheba to be his wife. The child was born to them. Nathan the prophet came to David and rebuked him in the name of God Almighty and condemned him and also laid a certain curse upon him that all of his seed, all of his children after him, even though they would rule over Israel, they would always be liable, have an extra liability if they went in the wrong path because of what had happened. Nevertheless, David repented, he was forgiven, and from his seed will come the future Messiah. Uh, this is not the end of the story. After, after Nathan had come to David and condemned him and rebuked him, the child died. Uh, David comforted Bathsheba. She had another son called uh, Solomon in Hebrew Shlomo, also known as Yedidjah. The the uh, the Jija meaning the friend of God. Uh, this was was this was Solomon. From Solomon will come the future Messiah. The, all all of the uh, the uh, disasters that Nathan had prophesied would come upon David did come upon him, but he continued to reign. He had ups and downs. He had continuous uh, continued to have trouble with the Joab, and uh, there was uh, friction between them until the end. When uh, David was old, or it says when he actually was 70 years old, which is not old by our standards, but apparently the, situ the time was different, David was different, and he was old and he was cold, so they looked for a beautiful woman throughout all of Israel. They found one called Abishag, a very beautiful woman. She was uh, appointed to minister to David to keep him warm. And, um, but they did not have intercourse. David did not have intercourse with her, as the Bible expressly says. And then, towards the end of his life, Adonia, one of his sons, sensed that the end was coming and tried to have himself recognized as king, wishing to preempt Solomon, who was the heir apparent, who David had designated to succeed him. Adonia tried to have himself recognized as king, in order to take over the throne whilst there was a still a chance to do so. Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, went together with Nathan the prophet to David and they told him what was going on. So David had Solomon made king, coronated in public. Solomon was only 12 years old at the time. Uh, Adonia saw that uh, all of his supporters deserted him. He, he asked uh, Solomon for mercy. Uh, uh, so Solomon uh, uh, granted him a pardon on condition that he behave himself, that he watch his step. And then uh, David uh, himself died, and before he died he blessed Solomon. He also warned Solomon that he had to get rid uh, of Joab if he wanted his kingdom to be stable. Uh, Joab had been a supporter of Adonia, and then uh, Adonia, after David died, went decided that he wanted to marry Abishag, the girl who'd been ministering to David beforehand. So uh, Adonia went to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she asked her to intercede for him to be allowed to marry Abishag. And now from the point of view of Bathsheba, it was parallel to her own situation. 
just as she had been formerly married to Uria, but their marriage had never been consummated. She had not been really married to him, and later David took her. And she saw this as uh, something uh, positive from her point of view. So she saw in Adonia a similar situation. Abishag had been appointed to David, but she had been a minister to, to him, but she had never had intercourse with him. There, nothing had been consummated between them. And now we have Adonia who uh, has, takes a fancy to her and wants to marry her. So Bathsheba went to Solomon and asked him to give permission to Adonia to marry Abishag. But Solomon saw things differently. Solomon saw that, understood that Abishag was considered the minister, personal minister, attendant of David, associated with David. And the law is that any anything that belonged to the king, his women or whatever, cannot be used by anyone else except by another monarch. And that Adonia was in effect maneuvering the situation in order that he may once again claim the throne. He was in, in effect a pla uh, planning treason, so Solomon had Adonia put to death. And then he also had the Yoah put to death. And uh, sometime later we learned from the Song of Solomon that he married Abishag. And what is the Song of Solomon? The Song of Solomon is actually a metaphor, a parable, an analogy, uh, whatever you want to call it, of the love for God Almighty for the nation of Israel. But it's based on a real situation, it's based on a certain uh, a romance, a love affair, one could say, uh, the, 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 that took place between Solomon and Abishag. So we may say that uh, in a sense everything comes full circle, and this is how things played out, and we see from the taking everything into perspective that even though David was culpable, he had acted as he should not have acted, his actions were understandable, and he, 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 he erred in, in judgment, he erred in certain, a certain direction, but not to such a great degree as we would have otherwise thought. May the Lord God Almighty guide us all so that we not err, that we not make mistakes, that we go in His way and do what He wants us to do. May He bless all the peoples of Israel. Thank you.